All right, hello everybody. Um, so this is the next of the Physics 121 videos. Um, and today, what I wanna do is I just wanna think back to the beginning of our discussion of magnetism. And let's just recall the following. At the beginning of this chapter that we're working on out of night, uh, I think it's chapter 29, uh, we saw that a moving charge was a source of magnetic field. So remember the very first thing we did uh, was we imagined a current and a wire and then we placed compass needles around that wire and we saw that the current could deflect the direction of those compass needles. The compass needles are like little bar magnets and so this moving charge was exerting a force on our little bar magnets and it did this by creating a magnetic field in the vicinity around the wire. So a source of magnetic field B and we were able to write down the Biot's of Art law which said that the magnetic field at some point due to a moving charge was equal to some constant mu naught over 4 pi times the value of the charge and then there was this cross product that we introduced and it was the cross product between the velocity v of the charge and r hat which points from the location of the charge towards the observation point and then divided by r squared where r squared is the distance between the charge and the observation point. So the question for today is if a moving charge can exert a force on a magnet like in the case of our compass needles, then can a magnetic field, say due to some permanent magnet or whatever, can a magnetic field exert a force on moving charges or equivalently a current, for example? So that's the question. And in order to answer that question, what you would do is you would set up some careful experiments and see if you can observe such an effect. And if you do, uh, then you would start to change some of the variables. So you change the strength of the magnetic field and measure how that force changes. You change the direction that the charge is moving and how does that affect the force. Uh, and then you could change the value of the charge and, and all of these things, okay? And so the second key experimental observation, so the first key experimental observation was that currents deflected uh, little magnetic dipoles. The second key experimental observation is that magnetic fields do in fact exert forces on moving charges. And so the fact that I said a moving charge is important, okay, because the first observation that we might make is we might take some charge that's not moving, fixed in position. And then we turn on a, we kind of, let's say we take a permanent magnet and we slowly approach this stationary charge. So we move it magnetic field in place very slowly. Then what we'll find is that the magnetic field won't exert any 
force on a stationary charge. So observation number one, only moving charges experience magnetic forces. Okay, so the magnitude of this magnetic force is going to be proportional to V. If we set V equal to zero, then the magnetic force is equal to zero. So FB is equal to zero for a charge at rest. Okay, what's the second observation? Um, we only have a force on a moving charge if there is a component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, so let's, let's imagine a picture. Let's imagine we've got some point charge Q and it's moving in some direction with a velocity V. And over here, there's some magnetic field. And so let's suppose that the angle between these vectors is theta. Well, what we could do is we could separate this velocity into components that are parallel and perpendicular to this magnetic field. And so this might be the perpendicular component, uh, which would be equal to V sine theta. And there's a parallel component, which is equal to V cos theta. It's the side that's adjacent to the angle theta. If you have a situation in which V perpendicular is zero, so that means the velocity is either parallel or anti-parallel to the magnetic field, then the force on that charge, that moving charge, due to the magnetic field is zero, it vanishes. So the key observation is that the magnetic force is proportional to sine theta. If theta is equal to zero or 180 degrees, then the magnetic force on that charge vanishes. Okay, so we require a perpendicular component, V perpendicular, to be non zero. All right, and then a third observation is we could try charges of different uh, Q values in the same magnetic field moving with the same velocity and in the same direction and we would find that the magnetic force is proportional to Q. So FB is proportional to Q and we could also do the same charge moving in the same direction with the same speed and then we could change the strength of the magnetic field keeping it in the same direction and we would find that the force on our charge scales in proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. Okay, the fourth and final observation is that the Magnetic force direction is perpendicular to both the velocity of the charge and the magnetic field that's exerting the force. And so if you look at all these little observations, um, what it might remind you of is what we found for the Beelzebub law,
where we ended up writing this magnetic field generated by moving charge as a cross product. The cross product was convenient because its magnitude was sine theta. It involved a sine theta. So if we had A cross B, the magnitude of that is the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times sine theta. So what we might be able to do is to write our magnetic force on a moving charge in terms of a cross product. The cross product was also useful because the result of A cross B is a vector, say C, and the direction of C is perpendicular to A and B. And so we require a force that is perpendicular to both V and B. And so it seems like if we involved a V cross B in our force, we would get the factor of sine theta that we want from the second observation. We would get that the magnetic field is proportional to B and we would get that the magnetic field is proportional to V and we would get that the magnetic force is, sorry, if I was saying magnetic field, I should have been saying the magnetic force. The magnetic force would be proportional to the sine theta, to the strength of the magnetic field, to the speed that the charge is moving, and we would get a force that would be perpendicular to both V and B. The only thing that would be missing is that the force should be proportional to the charge Q. And so what it turns out to be is that the magnetic force on a moving charge is equal to Q times V cross B. Um, there's one other rule here that or observation that we should check that the force on a moving charge requires a perpendicular component between V and B. So let's imagine in this expression V and B were parallel. Then V cross B would be VB sine of zero for parallel vectors and sine of zero is zero. And so this force would vanish if there was no perpendicular component. And so this has everything that we require. Um, in general, if you made all those observations about the force being proportional to this and that, we would come to this expression, but there could be a constant of proportionality, like a, say a mu naught or something like that. Um, it turns out that this expression is everything we need. There is, the constant of proportionality is just a one. So the magnitude of this magnetic force is Q times the magnitude of V cross B, which is V times B times sine theta. And the direction is, let's suppose that we had a velocity in this direction. Let's take this to be some charge that is positive. And then if we had a magnetic field B in this direction, uh, how would we determine the direction of the magnetic force? We would use the right hand rule for cross products. So you would put your right arm in the direction of the velocity vector V and you'd curl your fingers to make them parallel to the direction of the magnetic field B, and your thumb would point in the direction of the magnetic force. And that force is perpendicular to both the magnetic field and to the velocity of the charge. If your charge was negative, so this is V and this is B. And let's say we had a moving charge that was negative. So this is a positive charge, like a proton or something. And this is a negative charge, like an electron. Then you would do your right hand rule, V cross B. You'd, your thumb would point up. 
but then you would just reverse the direction of the force because you also have to multiply by the value of the charge out front. And if that charge is negative, then it reverses the direction of the magnetic force. And so for a negative charge, this magnetic force would point in the opposite direction. Okay, so let's see if we can apply this QV cross B for a magnetic force. And so the first example is going to be cyclotron motion. And so here's the scenario. We are going to imagine that we've got a region of space where there's a magnetic field that points into the screen. And so we imagine that this is also a uniform magnetic field. And so we might create this using a solenoid or something like that. So this is a magnetic field that's uniform and into the screen. Okay, and then what we do is we take a charge Q and let's suppose it's outside of this region of uniform magnetic field and initially it has some velocity V to the right and so we'll say this is some Q and let's just for the purposes of this example let's assume that Q is positive and so out here initially where the charge is the magnetic field is equal to zero okay so then we allow our charge to enter this region of space and so initially it's moving with a direction that's to the right and the magnetic field is into the page and so if we do right hand rule V is to the right so we put our arm to the right and we curl our fingers into the screen in the direction of the magnetic field and our thumb points towards the top of the screen and so we have a magnetic force that's towards the top of the screen and is perpendicular to the velocity so a couple of things to make note of when Q enters the region of the magnetic field the quantity V cross B is towards top of the page okay so therefore we have that the magnetic force is perpendicular to the velocity and that means the acceleration is also perpendicular to the velocity. Acceleration is the force divided by the mass and so it has the same direction of the force. When you have a object that is accelerating in a direction that's perpendicular to the velocity, its speed cannot change. That acceleration only acts to change the direction of motion. So in this case, uh, the speed of our charge does not change, only its direction of motion changes. Okay, um, so if it changes its direction of motion, let's imagine that our charge ends up following some kind of path. And then at this instant, we have a velocity that's in this direction. And then we do the right-hand rule to determine 
the direction of the magnetic force. And so we go V towards the top of the page, our arms towards the top, curl our fingers into the screen, and our thumb points to the right. And so now we have a magnetic force that's in this direction, and it's still perpendicular to the velocity. And so that force only causes a change in direction of our charge. And so over here, it has some velocity in this direction. And by now, maybe you can see that the magnetic force is always going to be perpendicular to the velocity. And our charge moves in a circle. It follows a circular path. And it gets back to its starting point over here, and it'll just keep moving in the same circle indefinitely. So a charge moving perpendicular to a uniform magnetic field undergoes circular motion. Um, if we have anything in circular motion, then it must have a centripetal acceleration. So it must have a centripetal acceleration that's equal to v squared over r. Okay, so the magnitude of our magnetic force is Q, and then we have V cross B. The magnitude of V cross B is V times B times the sine of the angle between the velocity and the magnetic field. The velocity is in the plane of the screen at all times, and the magnetic field is into the screen. So everywhere, this angle is 90 degrees, and the sine of 90 degrees is just 1. And so this force must be equal to the mass of our charge times its acceleration. But we said its acceleration must be the centripetal acceleration, v squared over r. And so therefore, what we get is qvb is equal to mv squared over r. We can cancel one factor of v, and let's solve for the radius of this circular motion. So therefore, the radius is equal to uh, mv over qb. Um, this circular motion of a charge in a uniform magnetic field is called cyclotron motion. And so the radius of the cyclotron motion is given by this expression. So the higher the speed, the larger the radius, the stronger the magnetic field, the smaller the radius. Okay, uh, let's continue with this analysis. Um, the circumference of the circular orbit is, let's call the circumference C. So the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, and the time to complete one full orbit is the period T. And so that period T is equal to, uh, let's see, if we took the circumference and divided by the speed, that's going to give us the time to... So that's the time to travel the circumference, which is 
the period of the orbit. And so circumference is 2 pi r over v. But we just calculated the radius of this orbit. And so let's take this expression and sub it into r so that our period is equal to 2 pi over v and r was mv over qb. So an interesting thing happens here is that the period of the orbit is independent of how fast the charge is moving. It's just equal to 2 pi m q over b. So the period is independent of the speed of the charge. That's kind of a surprising result, but what it comes about, the reason that that happens is because as we saw, as we increase the speed of our charged particle, the radius of the orbit increases. So that means the circumference gets larger as we increase the speed. Uh, and so the period is a circumference divided by the speed, and if the circumference is proportional to the speed, then the period becomes independent of that speed. Okay, uh, we could also calculate the cyclotron, cyclotron frequency. And so that's just equal to 1 over the period. Um, so let's say F cyclotron is equal to 1 over the period, which is QVB over 2 pi times M. And so this is uh, how many revolutions the charged particle completes per second. So it's the revolutions per second. Okay, let's do one other thing with our magnetic force. And uh, this one's kind of neat. Okay, so what I want to talk about is the so-called Hall effect. So here's the scenario. We're going to take a slab of conductor And we're going to have that conductor carry a current I. At the same time, we apply an external magnetic field that is perpendicular to the current direction. Okay, so what does that look like? Um, we're going to have a slab of conductor, and so maybe our slab of conductor looks like this. And we're going to have a current, let's say, I in that slab of conductor. So that means somewhere in here we have a charge Current is the direction of the flow of positive charge, and so that is going to be moving towards the top of the screen, and it's going to have some drift velocity Vd. So that's what current is, this net flow of positive charge. While this is happening, we have an external magnetic field that's perpendicular to the current direction, and I'm going to put that as a magnetic field that is into the page or into the screen. So this is a uniform magnetic field into the screen. Okay. Now, we know that the magnetic force is QV cross B, and so 
if we just do, uh, let me put a vector symbol on top of our drift velocity. So if we do V towards the top of the screen, cross B, which is into the screen, so we put our arm towards the top, we curl our fingers so that they're pointing into the screen, our thumb points to the left. And so that means there is a magnetic force that points to the left. Uh, and so what would happen is that this positive charge would be deflected towards the left edge of our conductor. All right. Um, now, what actually happens is that in a normal conductor like copper, we actually have electrons that are moving in the opposite direction of the current. And so it's actually the electrons that get deflected. And what happens is they get deflected towards the right of the conductor. So if we kept this current going, what we would end up doing is piling up electrons on the right edge of our conductor. If we did that, that would leave a, um, say a lower density of conduction electrons on the left edge of our conductor. And in other words, there would be some excess positive charge due to the fixed positive ions that make up the, the material of our conductor, like these positive copper ions that are fixed in place. So as we do this, as we allow the charge plus and minus to build up uh, on the two surfaces of our conductor, what happens is you get an electric field that points from the positive to the negative side. And as you build up this electric field, you're going to get an electric force on the moving charges. And that electric force will act in exactly the opposite direction of the magnetic force. And what will happen is you will build up the strength of this electric field until such a time that the electric force and the magnetic force exactly balance each other out. And so that's our equilibrium condition. So let's just make some comments about this. Um, so the magnetic force causes electrons to collect at the right edge of our conductor. This leaves behind an excess positive charge at the left edge. <clears throat> the separation of charge creates an electric field that points from uh, left to right or from positive to negative. So the result is that the magnetic force on our charge and the electric force on our charge oppose each other. Oppose each other. In equilibrium, what we'll require is that the magnitude of the magnetic force and the magnitude of the electric force become equal. If they weren't equal, we would still end up with a, say, stronger magnetic force, which would still cause the charges to be deflected, and that would just enhance the electric field until it became strong enough to exactly balance the magnetic force.
Okay, so um, the magnetic force is QV cross B, uh, but we've set up a scenario where V is perpendicular to B, so what we get is just Q and the velocity is our drift velocity of our charges and B. And so we'd have to sign in 90 degrees, which is one. Uh, the electric force, so this is, here I'm writing down just the magnitude of this force now. The electric force is Q times E. But if you look at this, this looks a bit like a capacitor. There's one charge surface positive and one charge surface negative. If we say the width of our conductor is W, then we could calculate the potential difference across our charged conductor. And so we could say that um, the potential difference delta V is minus the integral of E dot dl. But if we take a path in the direction of the electric field from one side of the conductor to the other side, then E dot dl is just E dl. And the electric field between uniformly charged surfaces is constant. And so what we get is just E times w. I guess there's a minus sign here that I should be careful about putting that in place. Um, and so what we could do is we could write the magnitude of the electric field is equal to uh, minus the voltage difference divided by the width of our conductor. And so if we're worried just about the magnitude of this electric force, then we could forget about this minus sign and we would write that the electric force is Q delta V divided by W. And our equilibrium condition is that these two must be equal. So Q V D B must be equal to Q delta V over W the Q cancels, and so what we're left with is that the drift velocity, or actually, let's calculate, what I'm gonna calculate is the voltage difference, because that's something that we could measure in an experiment. So this voltage difference is equal to uh, the width of the conductor, times the drift velocity, times the strength of the magnetic field. And so what we're going to imagine now is that in an experiment, what we could do is we could attach a wire to one side of our conductor, then we connect it to a voltmeter, and the other lead of our voltmeter goes to the other side of the conductor. And so this is a voltmeter. Okay, so we could just measure that. Um, and so what are the things that we could learn? Well, one thing we could do is if we knew the strength of the applied magnetic field, B, and we measure the width of our conductor, W, this voltage difference could be used to tell us the drift velocity. But what I wanna do is I wanna do something a little bit different. I want to, I just wanna remind ourselves of one thing. So the drift velocity could be expressed as the current density divided by the number of conduction electrons per unit volume. So this is the density, let's say the number density of conduction electrons. And E is the electron charge. Okay, and the current density was the current per unit area. Okay, so this is going to be I over N E 
A. So let's, let's draw our conducting slab in a little more detail. Let's say we have a conducting slab that looks something like this. So it's a slab that has some finite thickness. We'll call the thickness T, and this width here we've already labeled as W. All right, so if there's a current in our slab, then the current density J is equal to I divided by the cross-sectional area. And the cross-sectional area is the shaded region A, which has a width W and a height T. So A in our current density expression is W times T. And so that means therefore that the drift velocity is the current divided by the density of conduction electrons times the electron charge times the width times the thickness. Okay, so we're going to take this current density expression, uh, sorry, this drift velocity that we calculated, and we're going to sub it in right here and see what happens. So delta V is equal to, uh, it was W times the drift velocity, which we've now expressed in terms of other quantities. And then there was a factor of the magnetic field. Okay, W cancels. And what we're left with, therefore, is the potential difference or the voltage difference across our conductor is I times B divided by the density of conduction electrons times the electron charge times the thickness of our conductor. This voltage is called the Hall voltage. And so what you could do is you could place a conductor of known thickness T in a magnetic field with a perpendicular current. And what you do is you measure delta V, and so voltages are relatively easy to measure. Uh, there's lots of good voltmeters with lots of sensitivity, and so you measure delta V across the sample, let's say across the sample width, and if you know delta V from your measurement, you know the current that you put through the sample, you know its thickness, you know the value of the electron charge E, and you know the magnetic field that you established, maybe using a solenoid, then what you can do is you could calculate the conduction electron density. Then you can calculate N, the number density of conduction electrons. So in your textbook, there's a table where they say the number density of electrons, conduction electrons for different metals like copper and lead and tungsten and things like that. And so this Hall effect is really one way where you can make a measurement of these quantities. And so that's how it's done. If you were to do a physics degree, so you're going to major in physics, um, when you get to the third or fourth year lab, you have an option of doing exactly this type of Hall effect experiment. Okay, so that's where I'll stop. This was the force on a moving charge due to an external magnetic field. What we're going to do next is we're going to say, well, what if we don't have just a single isolated moving charge? What if we had a current 
in a wire that's immersed in a magnetic field, what is the force on that current carrying wire? All right, so talk to you next time. Thanks.